By now we already know what move semantics is, so we should be quite comfortable seeing functions, be it part of a class or not, that look like this. These functions usually have something to do with the ownership of the parameters that they receive by an R-value reference. Well, now that we also talked about templates, there is one more thing that we need to talk about, and it is a bit confusing at the first glance. You see, if we add a template into the mix, the value here is not really an R-value reference anymore. Okay, to spend you the suspense, the value in this example of ours is called a forwarding reference. And it is usually used in combination with std forward. Don't worry, we'll unpack what we see here a little bit later. More formally, to quote cppreference.com, forwarding reference is a function parameter of a function template declared as our value reference to cv unqualified type template parameter of that same function template. Sometimes you will also hear people calling it a universal reference, a term coined by Scott Mayers, but I prefer forwarding reference name, as it is the one used in the standard today. If you want to learn more about it, please feel free to read the author Odwire's post about this. He described it all much better than I ever could. Anyway, in the spirit of this course, uh, before we go into talking about how a forwarding reference works, I really want to talk about why it exists and what we might want to use it for. Long story short, just like normal R-value references, I see forwarding references exclusively in the sense of ownership transfer. However, where a standard R-value reference is designed to always transfer the ownership, a forwarding reference is designed for very generic context where it can decide if the ownership can be transferred based on the types of the input parameters. I realize that this statement might feel too general, so let's illustrate what I mean using small concrete examples. For simplicity, let us say that we have a class container that owns some data and has a simple method put that accepts a const reference to new data to be put into it. Our data class is going to be a very simple struct that is able to print from its copy and move assignment operators. Note that to keep the code to the minimum, I omit the rest of the special functions in this struct, specifically a copy and move constructors, as well as a destructor. Please see the rule of all or nothing lecture to make sure we're on the same page why it is important to have all those special functions. Finally, in the main function, we create an instance of data and pass it into our container. If we compile and run this code, we will get the output copy assignment, which indicates that the data is copied into our container just as we expect. Now let's say we don't want to create a data instance in our main function and want to pass a temporary object to be owned by our container straight away. We can modify our main function ever so slightly to achieve this. However, if we compile and run this code, we get the same output that indicates that copy assignment operator was called again. Not exactly what we want, right? The reason for this is, of course, the fact that the put method of our container class only accepts a const reference to data. By design, a const reference binds to anything. So a temporary data object is created, it gets bound to a const reference when passed into the put function, and its lifetime is extended for the duration of the execution of this function. Then, because data is a const reference, its copy assignment operator is called to copy itself into the private data underscore field of our container object. Now, as copying might be expensive for large objects, we might want to avoid it. So, uh, we can force the temporary data object to be moved into our container instead by overloading the put method for an R-value reference. If this, or the fact that we have to use to move on data here is confusing, do give the lecture about reinventing move semantics another go. I go in pretty detailed explanations about everything relevant to this there. Anyway, this does the trick, and uh, now we can have both behaviors, if we need them, in our main function. Passing the data variable will actually copy the data into our container, while passing the temporary will move this temporary into the container without performing a copy. Okay, so far we haven't really learned anything new, have we? Um, this is all just using the knowledge about move semantics and function overloading from before. But it is a necessary setup to understand why we might want to use forwarding references in the first place. In this simple case, we needed two function overloads to achieve the behavior that we wanted. Using forwarding references, we only need one function instead. For this, we remove the put function that takes a const reference 
and make the remain input function, one that takes an R value reference, a function template. We then also use the template parameter t instead of the data type in this function. And finally, we replace the std move with std forward, and uh, we have a fully functioning forwarding reference setup. If we compile and run this code, we will still get exactly the behavior that we want. The data object gets copied into our container, while the temporary data gets moved. So the forwarding references and std forward by extension allow us to automatically select if we want to copy or move an object based on the provided argument type. How neat is this? So I hope it makes sense what forwarding references allow us to achieve. But it comes at a cost. We have a template in the game, which means that we can now try to provide a wrong type, say int, into our put function. Which would lead to a nice compilation error, of course, that would tell us something about not being able to convert between int and an R-value reference to data. And while we can mitigate this and improve the error message by using traits or concepts, which we already talked about before when we talked about how to use templates with classes, it still complicates the code quite a bit. So is it really worth it? And I would argue that in the situations like this one in our example, I would not really use forwarding references and would just add the two overloads for the const reference and for the rValue reference instead. The reason being arguably better readability and the fact that in some cases the compiler will actually generate more code if we use a forwarding reference as opposed to explicit overloads in this case. This is though very close to being just a personal preference. The situation changes, however, should we have more function parameters to think about. To illustrate what I'm talking about, let us modify our container class a bit by adding another data entry to it. Note what we changed here. We now have two objects to store. Here both data1 and data2 have the same type, but they could of course be of different types. The put function now accepts two template arguments t and s, as well as two forwarding references as its function arguments, the data1 and data2. Now, what happens if we pass various combinations of l-value and r-value references to data into our put function? And I'll let you figure out the actual output from this code on your own. And please post in the comments what you think this code will print and why. But the main thing is that in all of these cases, the put function will do what we want. It will move the data it can move, and copy the data it cannot. And by now, if we look at our new put function long enough and think about how to write the same functionality without the forwarding references, we might start understanding where exactly the forwarding references are useful. Let's see how we would write our put functions without using forwarding references, shall we? To achieve the same performance, we need to have an explicit overload for every combination of l-value and r-value references that is possible for our function parameters, which means that we now need four different functions. And you can imagine now what would happen if we would have even more parameters. We didn't really talk about it just yet in this course, but we can pass any number of template parameters into a function using variadic templates, where using forwarding references is really our only way to write the code that will behave efficiently for any input parameters. So if you ask me, this is the reason why forwarding references uh, really exist in the language. And this also warrants a rule of thumb of when they should be used. Slightly controversially, I would recommend to only use forwarding references when we really know what we're doing in very generic contexts. When we have many function parameters of different types to think of, and when these set parameters might be copied or moved if their type allows for it. Now that we know why we might want to use forwarding references and what they allow us to achieve, I think it is important to also talk about how this is done. What is the magic behind the forwarding reference being able to figure out what to do given the argument type? And of course, as always with C++, this is not magic, but just clever engineering. In order to understand what happens there, we need to take a short detour through reference collapsing. This happens when we use type aliases to reference types and then use references with these type aliases. This basically leads us to effectively have many ampersands stacked together. So we need to map an arbitrary amount of ampersands onto the references that we know how to work with, the l-value reference denoted by one ampersand and an r-value reference denoted by two ampersands. And the rule for reference collapsing is actually quite simple. r-value reference to r-value reference collapses to r-value reference. All other combinations form l-value references. These static asserts here check if the conditions in them are true at compile time. Continuing with the topic of playing with the references and type traits, 
we can design a type trait to remove reference from a provided type completely. Such a trait is implemented as std remove reference t in the C++ standard library. Basically, passing any reference type through the std remove reference t trait alias will produce the actual type behind the reference. Armed with this knowledge, let us have a precise look at std forward and implement our own version of it to understand what happens under the hood better. For this, we need two overloads of our function template forward, one that takes an L value reference and one that takes an R value reference. Both overloads don't use their template type parameter directly to specify the type of their input parameter, but pass it through the std remove reference t trait. The function then always returns the input parameter cast to an R value of the template type parameter t or the t double ampersand type. This difference of the input parameter type and the return type in combination with the reference collapsing is what makes this magic work. To see it in detail, um, let us illustrate what happens when we pass arguments of various types into our forward function using the forwarding reference. Here we use a simple print function overloaded for L value and R value references. We then pass a number of arguments uh, into our do something function from main. We can observe that passing a variable number as an argument prints L value, which is what we expect. So let's dig in and understand exactly why it works. When we pass number to do something, the compiler needs to make sure that our forwarding reference type some type double ampersand matches our de facto input type and l value reference to int, so int ampersand. A way to make this happen is to deduce some type to be int ampersand, as then some type double ampersand is int ampersand double ampersand, which collapses to int ampersand, which matches the de facto input parameter. Given all of this, our call to forward some type value ends up being a call to forward int ampersand and int ampersand as a parameter, making t type in the forward function be int ampersand and choosing the first overload because std remove reference t is just int. So the first overload takes int ampersand. We then return t double ampersand from the forward function, which means that we return int ampersand double ampersand, which again collapses to int ampersand which means that we get an L value reference out of our forward function and the compiler picks the first overload of our print function and prints L value. Now let's do the same exercise for the situation when we pass an R value into do something function. We can see that the code prints R value for both situations when we pass a temporary and when we stood move from an L value. The compiler needs to make sure that some type double ampersand matches the input type so it trivially deduces some type to be int which leaves value to have type int double ampersand. Now, when we call forward int value, the t type in our forward function will be int. The remove reference t int will collapse to a simple int type. And considering that value has type int double ampersand, we might expect that a second overload would be called. But in reality, the first overload will be picked. We have to remember that value has a name and an address in memory, which makes it an L value that stores an R value reference, so it binds to the first forward overload. If this is confusing, which I admit it is a little bit, please have another look at the lecture where we reinvent the move semantics to learn why it was designed the way it was designed. Despite getting an L value reference as a parameter to our forward function, we return this value as the t double ampersand type or int double ampersand in our case. So in the end, we still convert our value to an R value reference and return it as such. This in turn leads us to picking the print int double ampersand overload and printing R value to the terminal. It might be a bit too quick to follow. So as usual, you can play with these examples yourself at your own pace by following the link to cppinsights.io that you can find in the description to this video. But I'm afraid there is still one more thing to discuss though. You might be still wondering, when is that second overload called? And really, the only case I can think of is when we directly call the forward function with a real R value, either providing a temporary object or an L value that uh, we explicitly mark as an X value with std move. I'll leave it up to you to figure out exactly why the second overload is called in both cases here, but if something is not clear, please ask questions. With this, we should be well equipped to detect when we see a forwarding reference used in the code. Not only that, but we should also leave with an intuition that it makes sense to use forwarding references if we have many function parameters of many template type parameters that can be either copied or moved depending on the reference type used. Finally, we even dove deep into how it all works, how the compiler picks which types to deduce and which overloads to pick. So I hope that this makes your journey towards understanding how to work with templates in C++ easier. 
and that you enjoyed this explanation of mine. Finally, if you feel that one or another concept don't fully make sense just yet, please give the appropriate videos on my channel a rewatch. So why not catch up on what Move Semantics is and maybe even reinvent it with me? For that, please click on the video right over here. Otherwise, if you'd like to watch the series on why and how to use templates, then do give this video a click instead. Thanks a lot for watching and see you next time. Bye!